welcome to the Longmont Housing Authority Board of Commissioners regular meeting today, Tuesday, June 18th, 2024. Um, can we have a uh, roll call, please? Uh, let's see. We should start this. I will. Joan Peck, um, Chair. Uh, Sean Coy, Commissioner. Aaron Rodriguez, Commissioner. Harold Dominguez, Interim Executive Director. Molly O'Donnell, Housing Director. Lauren Sully, Assistant Director. Tim Hall, Assistant City Attorney. Jiki Diablo, Commissioner. Marsha? Uh, Marsha Martin, Commissioner. Thank you. Katie and Sarah. Katie, Sarah. Housing Development, Project Manager. Sarah Arnie, Public Safety. Thank you. Uh, looks like we have two commissioners that may come in later. That is Commissioner Susie Dougal Faring and Commissioner Diane Christ. They are at CML and will be a little late. Uh, so we have are there any agenda revisions uh, to this? It is as it is. Um, let's have the approval of May 21st, 2024 minutes. I move uh, the approval of the May 21st, 2024 minutes that's presented. Second. Are there any additions or edits to those minutes? Seeing none, let's vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 <laughs> All those opposed? So that passes with Commissioners Chris and Hidalgo Ferry absent. Um, no public invited to be heard, so we will not open public invited to be heard. We're now at old and new business. We have a resolution, LHA 2024-09, a resolution approving the closing of various items in connection with the acquisition and construction of the ascent at the Holbrook Crossing project. And turn over to Molly now. Sure. Uh, so, I want to introduce a couple team members. Katie already introduced herself, but we have Brian Brad Weinig here from Penrose, our oh. development partner. So, he's here to support the project tonight, and if we have any questions, uh, we can go over those. We have talked about this project a lot in the past, so if anybody would like a summary of the project, we can certainly do so. Um, but my assumption was that you recall uh, what we're doing here. The 7 2 units of family housing. 75, that's a village of 72. <laughs> Thank you, good thing Brad's here. <laughs> uh, family housing with an attached early childhood education center we we're partnering with Wild Plum. Um, so what you have in your packet is the closing resolution mm -hmm. that allows us to um, accept financing sources, loan some of those funding sources into the project, and take a lot of other actions, including uh, property management agreement, our development agreements, and everything that goes along with it. There's one element not included in this closing resolution, and that is the acceptance of the $2 million Colorado Housing Foundation grant. Um, we're still negotiating the exact grant with them, so right now we have that um, slated for a special LHA meeting item during the July 9th council meeting. Uh, the goal to close is July 15th, we're cruising right along. It's, you know, as closings go, they always have a big rush of items at the end to, to sort out. It's doing the same, but it's going smooth, and we've been working as partners now for, what, two years? Feels yeah. like close to two yeah, years. To. Um, so, we're moving right along. So, so even though it's been two years, that's pretty fast. It is fast. Yeah. Because we got a uh, Traffa Litec Award on the first go. Right, right. Which is not, doesn't always happen. Right. Yeah, I was going to have to rack him up. I'll see you your next tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll go to you. Commissioner Martin, do you have any questions about uh, this resolution or the Okay, thank you. Since um, we have a quorum, do you have anything else you want to add to this? You want to give them a, a sense of time frame from closing, Brad, to starting to turn dirt to... Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, on paper, if everything goes well, uh, the plan is to close uh, in the middle of next month, as, as Molly mentioned, and start construction as soon thereafter as possible. Um, we're, we're very close to STP and permit approval mm -hmm. um, with, with your colleagues in the planning department. I'm uh, just waiting on one kind of final minor item. Feel great about that. So yeah, the plan is to start construction in July and 
It's uh, our co contractor is telling us it's going to be about a 15 month construction process. So we're looking to be opening our doors late next year. Um, and then hopefully the, the East East Center soon thereafter, just because there's some additional steps that need to be taken for that facility um, after it opens its doors to make sure that it's ready. But we're, we're very excited. So by the end of next year, we should have activity and people on site. We're very excited about that. Yeah, that is very exciting. So I think we just need a, uh, a motion and a vote on this item. Mm -hmm. And then I have a couple of comments in terms of Okay, so can I have a motion to move this resolution? Um, before we get started, uh, Commissioners Susie and Uncle Perry has entered the room. And before we do make a motion, I forgot that we need to um, make this motion. Uh, because Commissioner Martin is virtual, so we need to be able to uh, suspend by reference the Council Rule of Procedure 25.2.8.2 to allow for Commissioner Martin and Commissioner Chris to participate remotely in this meeting. So is she going to be remote? Diana? She stated that um, as soon as she finished. So she will she be remote. Okay. Oh. Okay. I approve that. I don't okay. <laughs> So, uh, Councillor McCoy has moved to approve the suspension of the rule of procedure rule. Can I have a second? Second. Uh, any discussion? Let's vote. All those in favor of suspension, say aye or raise your hand. Aye. aye. Um, and all those uh, in opposition? No one? That passes unanimously. Welcome, Marsha. Remote B. <laughs> Now, uh, we've had a motion to, uh, let's see, to move LHA 202409? Okay. Now, I'll, I'll move resolution 202409. Okay. Okay, it's been moved by Councillor, uh, Commissioner Rodriguez, seconded by Commissioner Yog Yarbrough. Sorry, I want to call you Yogurt. I have a... <laughs> <laughs> what is it? And I was on call for that yogurt. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed? Seeing none, that motion passes. Yep. Um, Chairperson, uh, one of the things I did want to say is um, if you didn't have a chance, there was um, a story picked up on Nine News regarding the opening of the Crispin Apartments and what we're doing. Yeah. Um, this for Brad Holly housing team. Uh, the more information we can get, start getting into Rogelio, who is our new public information officer. He is staying in contact with that reporter uh, in terms of kind of the, how, the broader housing mm -hmm. approach that we're taking as a community mm -hmm. and everything that we're doing. So there's interest and running follow-up stories on the projects that we're building and, and talking to her uh, when we talked about this project with the early child care component definitely interested in it so when we're ready mm -hmm. uh, definitely start feeding that information in and um, don't want to miss this opportunity because we've, we've actually got her teed up on this project okay. The house pad project and really understanding globally what we're doing uh, for housing so i wanted to let you know if you haven't seen it we'll make sure they send you that news article mm -hmm. or that that link but also i think there's more opportunities for all of us in the partnership i think it's a great idea especially for the governor to see it so he knows that we are doing yeah. what he is trying to push so we're ahead of the game uh, the next thing on the agenda is resolution, resolution LHA 2024-10, approval of Dry Creek Trail easements. I'll take this one as well. Sorry. First, I want to just tell Brad, if you would like to go, you can always listen to trail easements on a different so, site. Yeah, <laughs> I made the trip. Let's go. Let's he see, made yeah. the trip. I made, I made the trip from Denver, so I drove all the way from Denver. I know. So not that far. Oh, 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 sorry. I still have to Thank you. Okay. All right, so uh, this one is in regards to the land owned jointly by the city and the LHA located north of the suites below Dry Creek Trail. Okay, thank you. Um, 
we have talked about a, couple, a month or two ago, we talked about potential design concepts for what we may like to see back there because Element Properties has a uh, purchase option agreement on that land. And in order to exercise that option, they need to start planning for what to do back there. But in the meantime, we worked with them and with the city parks department to plan out the alignment of the Dry Creek Trail extension. And because the land is owned uh, 59, 41%, I'm not doing math on a Tuesday night, the city owns 59% of the land, and then the LHA owns the remainder. Uh, the city doesn't necessarily need to secure an easement against itself, but because the land is jointly owned, we do need to encumber the land on the LHA side. Oh. And Tim can help me if I say any of that wrong. Cause it's He's correct. You, you the city couldn't <laughs> give an easement to itself, but mm -hmm. because LHA is an undivided co-owner, um, you do still need an easement on that side. Yeah. So a quirky application of the law. It is quirky. Makes um, sense. So. Yep. And so the city is right. hoping to get construction of this trail extension okay. in mid-2025, that's mm -hmm. the goal, but having this piece secured is one of those early mm -hmm. steps along with design. Um, so what we did talked about a little bit when we brought this side up a couple months ago is that we did an exercise with parks and element to make sure that the trail alignment would, what does that do to the developable nature of the land, and it, it does not impact it. We would still be able to build um, what is something that is similar to what is um, conceived of in the option agreement. <coughs> mm -hmm. um, and so it's really, it's in the floodplain, it's right at the top of bank of the ditch. And so we just made sure we planned in advance altogether and everyone's on the same page. So on this issue, a few things came into play uh, from a broader funding source. So to orient you, suites here, Zinnia here, Roughly, this is where the next piece will be in terms of how we look at it. So we had different funding sources in play, and in this case, uh, the property, this property that Molly's talking about, was purchased with 750. This is like one of the. We did this before we took over mm -hmm. the housing authority, so it was about I think 750 thousand dollars that the city's um, affordable housing fund put into this. Um, it did create some consternation with some of our other departments because they weren't used to seeing city property in the housing fund because based on how the housing funds created they were going to utilize it for another purpose and they were going to have to actually pay for the land from the housing authority um, similar to open space and how you deal with those different funding sources what we actually what actually came through in terms of developing this is a we know that access into the village of the peaks from this location now that Zinni is built is a challenge so this will improve access both to sunset and to village of the peaks for the people that live in this area and in, in these properties the you know what i should have shared so you can see the sidewalk here so what i was saying is is it provides access to village of the peaks also provides access to sunset, fills our trail connections, which is part of how we're, we're starting to build out our transit system. The other value that this brings to um, the Housing Authority and the City's Affordable Housing Fund is, as part of this, they're going to be doing the landscaping improvements. So if we were to develop this property on our own, under our code, we would have to build and design the landscaping improvements, including the trail. So what this does is, is it doesn't place that expense on the back of the development once we move into that northern parcel. Mm -hmm. So that's really what we're exchanging mm -hmm. the easement for is the fact that they're building the trail connection and providing the landscaping improvements which will not put that on the back of the housing authority or the city's affordable housing fund. So that's the consideration in this agreement. It really was a win-win when we looked at it from all angles. Nobody really had to give up anything that they really wanted for this. You know, I, I've heard since I started on council that this was going to be part of the trail connection uh, years ago. So it's always been in the planning right. process. Mm -hmm. 
I'm glad to see it's going forward. It just got wonky when we had different funds playing in, into this mix. And I wanted to get that on the record so people clearly understood what the consideration was for the easement and what we're getting in return. So that when we look at our responsibilities as a housing authority, you know you're not just giving them the land, it's also reducing an obligation when we develop that northern parcel. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. We would need a motion to yep. approve the resolution on this one. I'll so. move the uh, resolution LHA 2024-10. So moved by Commissioner Hidalgo Perry, seconded by Commissioner Jar Rowe. So can I get It's not working. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I still have Jar Rowe. Um, That's all right. Is there any discussion? Okay. Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? So that passes unanimously. We're now at the uh, Virginia Selection Plans. Another resolution, LHA 2024-11, the LHA Tenant Selection Plan. So this is um, a multi-step one here. So I'm going to walk you through, and I will let you know when we would request your motion for a resolution. So tenant selection plans. Um, this is something that um, we have had in place. Our LHA general tenant selection plan has been in place for a long time. It, it guides the um, application acceptance process for prospective tenants at our properties. And so we have the overall LHA, I'm gonna call it TSP to be short, um, that has served all of our properties to date. Um, the suites had its own tenant selection plan but it was really driving MHP and their voucher selectance. Um, but then it also referred back to LHA's generals one, so it was very confusing. So one thing that we needed to do with the LHA general tenant selection plan is really permanent supportive housing. It has its own um, parameters around tenant selection, so we wanted to have them separate so that it was very clear, especially when we're working with partners on permanent supportive housing, what we go to is for, as our guide. Um, so in the LHA general tenant selection plan, we did pull out the suites, and it's going to be on its own. So we'll get to the suites in a moment. Focusing first on this general one. Um, overall, just a reminder, when we're talking about tenant selection plans, this is only about accepting new tenants, not issues once they are tenants. So that Everything, if you are already a tenant, if there's any issues regarding um, behaviors, lease violations, etc., that is all goes through our housing retention plan and a whole different process. So we're only talking about accepting new tenants into LHA properties. We wanted to make some updates to the LHA general one. Um, like I said, remove the suites. Secondly, clarify student eligibility. Um, this was kind of a confusing section before and we really wanted to make it very clear about how full-time students at institutes of higher education can be um, considered for tenancy. And so we pulled out some helpful language from the regs to be a lot more clear. We also, in recent fair housing trends, um, there's a lot of changes that have been happening in regards to tenancy. And so we wanted to update that with some more modern practices that we've learned through fair housing trainings and um, by working through best practices. So we don't actually check credit scores anymore. We don't check on people's status of owing to creditors. Um, but we do pull credit checks for the purposes of looking for eviction history. But we wanted to be sure that we were clear in our tenant selection plan what we use that information for. Um, we really are only looking for if they had money owed to prior landlords, we can get kind of rental history on there. So there's just a few brief updates in red lines to this plan that we would consider, um, uh, request you consider adopting. That's really following fair housing rules and just for clarity. There is not a lot of um, of meat in terms of process that changes in this. So that would be my first request tonight, is to consider adoption of the LHA General Tenant Selection Plan updates. Are there any questions? 
I do have one, um, and it's probably, I'm thinking of children who age out of foster homes who are 18 and possibly employed, but is there any different application process for them uh, than from somebody who has a history of work or school? Or nope, it's the same application process. Um, really, they would still go through income qualification and be looking for evidence of income to be able to pay for for the, the rent that's owed at the unit. Um, there's not really a separate process okay. for that. Um, there's certain considerations that might come into play. This is a, it's a guide. Okay. It's, it's not gonna cover every single instance in terms of a prospective applicant that we're looking at, um, but it's at least giving staff the procedure. Now, you, if people are on a waiting list, they don't go through this procedure until there's an opening in there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Until you're pulled off the waiting list. Okay. Yeah. Is there a question about the this section on? What page are you on? Uh, it is page 3.4. I think that's where the student issue came came up. Is there a specific question on that? So that's section 3.4. That's page five up at the top right. Okay. I know that page. Oh, and is that a duplication? I mean, it's verbatim from the regulations. But why the reference to students who are in higher education? Well, they there's a lot of considerations from what you can see here when you're considering them for federally assisted housing. Um, it's not, so by the way, you'll see here, there's student eligibility. There's one section that's for just LIHTC housing units and one for federally assisted housing units. So that's project-based vouchers, et cetera. They have a, a different screening process. And there's really specifics here. You can be eligible if you are a student, but you have to be hitting some of these boxes where you're eligible for other purposes. Okay. Um, and the only thing I saw, it makes sense. I don't even need to answer. So do we know the youngest uh, they could be? So, so as, as we see, is under 24 years of age, but what is? It says no assistance should be provided to any individual who is enrolled as a student and who is under 24 years of age. This, the, we put this directly from the regulatory language because it's confusing enough. We didn't want to further confuse it because it seems like there's double negatives in the sense. <laughs> but it's really that if you meet these, you should not be given federal housing assistance. But if you were working and you're on the ET, then you'd be eligible. Yes. You wouldn't be made ineligible by this. Okay, so where does a, I'm just asking, where does a 16 year old that's receiving social security if their parents pass in need housing? I think that they would income qualify like any other. If you're under, if you're a minor, I'd have to scan through this for anything that about being under, under 18 or not. So that would be if you're emancipated or not, because if you're not legally emancipated, then you're still connected to someone. And so I think they would have to be part of the family. And I think this all ties into if you're qualifying, if you qualify for um, a voucher, you're probably also getting Pell Grant, and so you're getting federal assistance, and then I think it's avoiding the double dipping. Right. That, that's the impetus on the student is a double dipping. Mm -hmm. And I, again, I was going to ask about this, but decided I didn't need to, but now I'm going to again. So does that? come into this line you have for financial assistance received by a student living with their parents in assisted housing and receiving section eight assistance is not included in annual income. Right, so like a Pell Grant. If the entire household is is living in an LHA unit, they're taking the income for the entire household, so that means the parents primarily, and then if you have a student living there who receives financial assistance, federal financial assistance, they would not count that as part of the income calculation. Okay. That issue around emancipation has been kind of, well, in my years of, well, I was teaching at uh, Boulder Tech, <coughs> this was kind of a tricky one because we talked about 
could you be emancipated, who is emancipated, and that sort of thing. And I guess that maybe is a legal question because uh, in Colorado there was some sort of question about that ability. But uh, that's something to look into and doesn't have to be totally pried into at this moment. <laughs> but I think it's something that we uh, that uh, Commissioner Yarbrough brings up that is interesting and important because we need to know what that definition is because it's often thrown around, but it's not necessarily in all states equal. Not some don't recognize it. I think Colorado may not, or didn't at the time when I was teaching at that level. Mm, interesting. So the the age plays into it in that piece, but if you were to consider a different household that receives Social Security assistance, we have those on the other end of the age scale, and that's just counted as part of their income, and you could likely still qualify. Um, okay. I guess I'm just, I'm looking at students who could have at one point, you know, became homeless, uh, you know, without housing because of parents due to parent illness and they pass on and they now receive social security but yet in school um, may not be 18 um, things like that they could be at front range I mean we got kids taking college classes in high school so um, I mean I, I'm not trying to complicate anything I'm just asking because I know those situations happen mm -hmm. And it might be, if we had a prospective tenant in that situation, we'd probably look at this and see which of the two was most flexible to allow it. I think we would just find the right path for the, the right circumstances. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, as part of the housing conversation, you all and your role as uh, commissioners and council have actually talked about how do we solve the need for housing with uh, young adults mm -hmm. between 16 and 18 that mm -hmm. are either you know, kicked out of their home because of sexual orientation. I mean, there's issues that we're seeing, and I think we would try to weave them through to the right outcome. Mm -hmm. But I think when we look more globally at housing, we do know that that's a, ch a challenge that exists, and we need to keep that within our eyesight to figure out if there's other solutions. Mm -hmm. okay. does, does passage of this language inhibit or tie, hand, tie our hands around working with students who would fall in that situation? No, and it is, it is already applied to us. Mm -hmm. I okay. just didn't okay. have it clearly written in the procedures okay. manual. Okay. Yeah. It was th there was something there. It was just broadly said, refer to regulations. And sometimes we like to do that for flexibility if they change. But in this case, it was too confusing. We wanted specifics. Specific. Okay. And honestly, if we found a solution that we were allowed to do by law, and it was just a conflict within the policy, but mm -hmm. we were legally allowed to look to, to, to work, move forward, yeah. we bring the policy change to you. Okay, you yeah. Know. You know, it's just, it, are we allowed to do that mm -hmm. legally? Okay. Any more questions? Seeing none, uh, can we have a motion for LHA 202411? I move uh, LHA uh, 202411. Second. To move by Commissioner McCoy, seconded by Commissioner Fidalgo Faring. Um, any more discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? That passes unanimously. Thank you. We're now on to the uh, Swedes and Zinnia support of health and care selection plan. Okay, so moving off of LHA General, moving down to permanent supporting housing. So I'm going to talk, I'm going to compare the two a little bit at the broad level, and then we're going to dig into both a little bit more closely, just so we can follow along. Okay, the suites. As we know here, the suites was not purpose-built permanent supportive housing. It was a hotel that was purchased and converted. It was not built with trauma-informed design principles. Um, it is an old funding model. PSH is not set up and structured this way any longer, the way that the suites was. Um, it has, of the 81 units that are rentable, because the 82nd is an employee or community manager unit, we have 41 units that are served by federal project-based vouchers by the LHA as the end administrator. So these people come off of the LHA's suites waiting list. Then we have 40 
units with associated permanent uh, project-based vouchers that are administered by mental health partners um, with as, a, as the arm of DOH from the state. So all of our 41 vouchers on the LHA side are sourced through local case conferencing, the coordinated entry program through um, Housing Solutions for Boulder County. For the MHP vouchers, 40 of them, um, up until February, those were sourced half from the One Home List out of Metro Denver Homeless Ni Initiative. We call it statewide list because that is the, the, it's attached to DOH. Half of them came through local case conferencing through HSBC. So back in February, we had conversations with DOH and MHP, and this was a culmination of, a, of years of conversations, but we got um, approval from DOH to go ahead and switch those last 20 vouchers from the one home list to sourcing through local case conferencing. So this is really critical. A, it prompted us to look at the tenant selection plan because we had to make that change at minimum. But B, it was really important because of the history of the suites, how it was structured funding wise, how the building is not purpose built, <coughs> permanent supportive housing, which is really common form design is the way of the future. Um, it just is not necessarily fundamentally set up to be able to handle high acuity of need people as well as some others that come in with more of a modern structure. Um, it is not to be said that coming from the statewide list means somebody has a higher acuity of need, but it is possible because you're bringing people in that don't necessarily have as the highest propensity of ties to long compared to somebody coming in for Boulder County's list. Mm -hmm. So, yes. I, mean, I think the difference is um, when you have folks that are coming in with coordinated entry in the HSBC, yeah. HS, I give the acronym, HSBC, they have connections to social workers, they have connections to, in many cases, our, our core and lead teams, and, and so there is, there is a, a more robust support system for those individuals. Mm -hmm. I think what we've seen is when individuals didn't have that support system, we tended to see more issues, and I just think that's a big piece of ensuring success for someone. So that, at a minimum, prompted us having to pick up their tenant selection plan, but at the very same time, we were building the brand new Zinnia tenant selection plan with the team that includes Element, Mental Health Partners, DOH, and Boulder Shelter for the Homeless. Um, and so we had these two running parallel and learned a lot through that process and really felt that between the need to update for the sourcing of, of prospective tenants, between wanting to pull it off and be much more clear than referring back to certain sections only of the LHA general tenant selection plan, we decided that it really made sense to look at this a lot closer and um, kind of scrub it. Mm -hmm. The last update was done in 2021, but it was that was one of many updates over the years. So it was an old tenant selection thing. Um, so pausing on suites for a minute, we're going to come back to it, but I want to compare with Zinnia since we have these two documents running side by side. Mm -hmm. So one of the things before we switch to Zinnia uh, to, to dig into why we were able to do this, I think that is directly related to the decisions that you all have made in your capacity as uh, commissioners for the housing authority and then your role as city council members. So specifically when we were talking to the state about this issue and everything we were dealing with, we started going through the litany of things that we were funding. So in many of these positions will apply more broadly to all of our housing portfolio. So to know you all will have some of this coming in too. Um, so the supportive services position now as, a, as the Housing Authority of Orgy approved the Clinician 1, it'll be permanently attached to the suites, but then your role as a city council member, you approved um, two additional clinicians out of the marijuana funding that we have. Mm -hmm. Those will work with the suites and be part of the process, but also support our broader housing portfolio when we're having issues. When we then started connecting the, the lead and core teams that are involved in supporting our broader mission, you know, the state representative literally, because we weren't in agreement with MHP, said, I hear what you're saying, but when you look at the totality of the resources that the city's putting into play, and 
identify in the case of the suites saying anyone who lives in there is going to come out of the coordinated entry process, which is really then focusing on the folks that are in Walmart, Walmart County, where we have the resources close by. So it, it is a product of your investment in the broader um, social service side of what we're doing on the housing system that actually allowed us to make this change. So I wanted your actions directly contributed to that. And really our message all along was the suites wasn't structured for this funding, funding supportive services. It wasn't properly structured to, to meet the needs. For example, at some time between us and MHP, we only had one supportive services person on site. That's a 1 to 80 ratio, yeah. when a best practice is 1 to 15, if not 1 to 12, is what they want people to target, which it was way behind. Mm -hmm. And we said this wasn't structured correctly, the funding is not there, and so because of this, and we tried and tried and couldn't get this sorted, the city came around the bend and said, well, it's important either way, we're going to do it inside or outside of this project, and DOH recognized that. And we're continuing to evolve. So that was six months ago? Yeah, February. For February, we have that conversation. Since February, we have really taken the next step in involving um, this side of the, the, the mental health social, social service world, where we've now created a mental health center of excellence within the city and the housing authority structure. And, and so, we have the <coughs> core representative, Sarah, and the work that she's doing. Um, what's the other acronym? LEAP. LEAP, no. Um, unhoused work. Neighborhood Impact Team, Mental Health Services. What's the end? Uh, HSBC, I guess. Yeah. People working in HSBC are senior service mental health professionals, mm -hmm. children, youth, and family mental health professionals. Are supportive because every position we just talked about they're now coming together organizationally to then start looking at how we're supporting the broader community so we're able to, to you know bring more resources to bear and apply it throughout the community so we're continuing to evolve this aspect of the housing authority in the city to where we're able to maximize the resources we have in play and so as we continue evolving, it's not just one group you're dealing with. Right. It's multiple groups, and when we have a, a, situ a challenge or we're dealing with something, everybody comes in and try to assist it. That's something that's going to serve all of our properties that we're partnering on, but it serves a broader community as well. So I wanted to tie these things together because we're really taking more of a systems approach yeah. um, to maximize our efficiency and have everyone working collectively versus an independent silos. Okay, so that's the suite's history and how we got here. Zinnia, um, purpose-built, trauma-informed design, um, fully supported services budget for multiple years. Boulder Shelter is um, doing the case conferencing for prospective tenants and then also provides the support services so they stay with them all the way through. Um, it, if there was going to be a permanent supportive housing project that was intended to be able to support harder to house, um, higher acuity of need people, it would be a project like Zinnia. So Zinnia has, MHP administers all of the vouchers. That's uh, 55 total. Um, Half of those vouchers are coming from the local case conferencing. Half of them, minus one, so 27, because it's an odd number, are coming from that one home list. So there could be com people coming in with higher acuity and need, need at that site, but it's better equipped to handle it. So it's an intentionally low barrier to entry because this is a last resort housing opportunity. Um, also, use of that statewide list is a requirement of the DOH funding that made the project happen. Um, so, the difference, one critical thing between the two, the suites, all 80 vouchers are federal, federally funded. That comes with an extra layer of requirements and restrictions. The Zinnia ones are all state vouchers. 
lower barrier to entry, lower amount of restrictions on them. LHA is the owner at the suites, the primary general partner. LHA is not in the ownership structure at Zinnia. We are a third party property manager. So it is ultimately that owner plays a big role in making a lot of the calls about the tenant selection plan. So who is? Quick clarification, LHA is a special limited partner. Right. Is a, uh, right. Through LHA just, Ventures, but okay. just for the tax credit. Right. right, thank you. Okay. But that's like a But we are not a nominal necessarily a decision-making authority. So who who is it? Who is the decision-making element. element? Element. So you're probably going, why did that happen? This was one of the projects when we talked about the land transfer and what we were purchasing that occurred prior to the city taking oh. over the operations of the housing authority, okay. mm -hmm. but after the challenges that we had at the suites. Okay. And, and so in that conversation, the, the city created the contract with Element on the permanent supportive side and we really wanted these other groups to come involved based on the challenges we had in the suites. And so it's a it's an agreement that was put in place prior to us taking operational control, which is why we're not necessarily in the ownership position. We've taken uh, different approaches since that time. Okay. Is, is this the first time that we have worked hand in hand with the Boulder Shelter on projects? Mm -hmm. I think that's amazing. Amazing. There is another um, element that we are lucky to be in, which is this exact team, minus LHA, um, just went through this entire process for Bluebird Boulder, which yeah. is the sister project to this one. So they've been through it. That's for, it was about 40 units, I think. Um, and they've gone through this whole process and created their own lessons learned and brought into this process. And we meet with them every week to go over, make sure we're using a permanent supportive housing consultant um, that is funded through the project to help get everybody clear expectations of you own this piece, I own this piece, and what what all the levers are and how we need to make decisions. So it's been a good process. Um, okay, so those are the key differences between Zinnia and the suites, and that plays into how these tenant selection plans come together. Um, one other, wrinkle at the suites is that we have two different voucher administrators instead of one. So if not every unit and every tenant is talking to the same people, which adds a layer of complexity and coordination. We have to be on the same page with MHP and B mm -hmm. working through this jointly. Okay. Oh, and also to ensure fair housing because we don't, it's right. in the same building, two different people making decisions. We have to coordinate, make sure we're clear. Okay, so um, in some of those, you know, using that consultant, PSH consultant, was really helpful to look at our Zinnia TSP2. So some of the things that we went through, we went through this Zinnia tenant selection plan, every single word of it, and analyzed who would think of what about it, because we are, we are here, well, let me start with um, MHP and Boulder Shelter, the people case conferencing people through. They are focused on that individual. Mm -hmm. The person, the individual has needs and they are helping them serve that need, which is to get into housing and have the support services. Once they're housed, now we have LHA as the property manager and we are thinking about them, but also the community to make sure it's functioning, everyone can get along, we have keep the property, you know, peaceful enjoyment for all of the above. So it's recognizing where we're all coming from in that. Okay, so the Zinnia Tenant Selection Plan, DOH, is the approver on that. So that is done. We don't have the decision-making authority on approving it. We just helped put it together with everybody as one of four partners. So that is here for just information. And then what I wanted to do is really show you the differences between the screening criteria at both properties because they are different and this is going to be something that we have to manage carefully for the foreseeable future. So, <coughs> I've got my 2021 suites, my new draft suites, and are now 
<laughs> official Zinnia. Okay, so Zinnia, like I said, low barrier to entry. What we are, what is identical across Swedes and Zinnia is anything about meth and registered sex offenders. So in both, if you have ever been convicted or evicted for the use or possession of meth, that is an automatic denial with appeal rights for both. If you have ever been convicted of manufacture, production, or distribution, automatic denial, no appeal rights. Both um, have an automatic denial for a household that's subject to a lifetime registration as a sexual, as a sexually, what am I doing? Registered sex offender. Thank you. Registered sex offender, RSO. Both of them are that. It, it, Zinnia, you can appeal. And let me check here. Yes, not appealable at the states. For a lifetime registered sex offender. There are other levels, and this is where we've had to talk to Sarah quite a bit. There are other levels of RSOs that actually are not restrained from living in certain locations in, because of state law. Um, we would see that come up, but we would, that's not an automatic denial. You can consider circumstances and, and such. Okay. For example, we do have a daycare across from the suites. Right. It is within a thousand feet, but there is no requirement, local requirement to limit them from living there. So there might be, we have never had a problem. We've never had any sort of concern in that arena, but that is something that we looked deep into to make sure we knew what we were doing here. Okay. Um, we are now looking at the old Suites 2021 TSP looked at patterns of criminal behavior and it was frankly very squishy. Um, and, and again, this TSP is a guide for us to stay on the same page as our partners. Everybody comes in with a whole slew of circumstances that we always consider as a group when we're, we're considering whether this person's gonna be successful at the site. Um, but we did tighten that up for the new suites draft TSP because A, we've, we're filtering it through fair housing and B, we are um, walking the balance of permanent supportive housing, so low barrier to entry. However, we have federal project-based vouchers here which add a layer and because it's the suites and it is not purpose-built and necessarily ready for high acuity of need, we have that other layer there too. So you're gonna see that, how that plays in the, the uh, criminal background screening and the rental history screening. Mm -hmm. But overall, I'd say what we attempted to do was tighten up the suites one, mm -hmm. be more clear so that us and MHP don't operate in the gray, mm -hmm. um, but still have room to have conversations when there are circumstances to be considered. So there's a lot more we could dig into in terms of the specific you know, misdemeanors versus felonies and uh, Convictions is what we look at instead of charges, but I wanted to pause and see if there were specific questions about that. Do you go through the, uh, what is it called, Colorado to check on backgrounds? Uh, well, Sarah, do you want to talk Sarah's trying to figure that sure. out. So, yes, um, currently for Zinnia applicants, I have been doing their um, CBI and National Criminal Background Check. Okay. That is until we determine a really good company that we know we're getting the right things. I think we talked about that last time, but um, yes, yeah, so I'm, currently I'm doing that and we're hoping by the beginning of July we have a company selected. Is there a per person or per request cost? Mm -hmm. oh, yes. It used to be um, about 50 well, bucks. So the application fee is set, and Molly can talk a little bit about that, but that, that is in, when we move to a background company, um, the, all the costs are round together, and I believe with Zinnia, there's no application fee, Molly? I'm not sure. We're still sorting it out, I think. It's only, okay. so you're, you're only allowed to charge what it costs you. Okay. So to refresh you all, 
the challenge that we had with the existing background company is, so we, we had one, it wasn't working well, we went to this other company. They were doing a, a really good job getting information because um, if you remember, part of the challenge is many states require you to go to the jurisdictions. Not, they're, they're not really uploading it into a database. Well, this company sold uh, to another company. And we began noticing that the, the detail in the background checks was different. Mm -hmm. And so Sarah's trying to find another company that gives us the same level of service that we had originally prior to that company being sold. So that's one of her projects. Mm -hmm. Oh, she's um, making progress on it, Sarah? Yes, I'm actually waiting. Since you and I talked, I'm, I'm still waiting. We're playing phone tag with the old owner. Okay. Um, because I really want to, I want to pick his brain. He's been in the industry a really long time and would have some good recommendations and also be able to point, point us, um, you know, in a direction that I think will get good customer service. So there is one that reminded me of one thing that we are still trying to put in Visinia, if, if it gets to be put in, it'll be coming in as an amended one. And we're trying to insert in suites before it gets approved by DOH. And that is um, prospective tenants with an active restraining order against LHA staff or city staff that frequents the property. Because we have, we are now in that, we've had two restraining order situations that got real interesting the last two, you, no, no, six months. Um, and so we're trying to see how we can plan for that. DOH is noodling it right now. Mm -hmm. So, but in, in our mind that a person with that, it wouldn't be a successful situation. So um, that is one thing that's still pending on both. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or? It's a lot of work. It's, it's, a lot of work. Yeah. I will say this was an extremely challenging exercise, balancing multiple partners, federal laws, best practices. Mm -hmm. um, it just, it's just a, and it's a touchy climate. It's hard stuff yes. that you're dealing with. Um, so for the suites, what I'm just looking for tonight is direction um, to keep moving forward with this. We're tweaking final things on the MHP's application process, but then the intent would be to submit this to DOH, get their blessing, and then come back and formally adopt. But make sure you're good before we get that far. So we're all good. Uh, no, I think just direction. Okay. Just direction. Well, I think the direction you're going is the way to go, and it's hard to say go in a different direction. Yeah. 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 Why would we do that? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so Marcia, you're good. I see your head shaking, and um, so that's your direction. Keep going the way yeah, you want to stay, I, of course. I agree with you, Joan. It's, my head is shaking because, yeah, why would we do anything else? This yeah. makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, make project progress. So, uh, Harold, the interim executive director report on the development updates. I'm going to look at Molly on that one. Sure. So, we know what's going on with the scent, although we could talk more and make Brad's time more uh, oh, scent related. Oh, let's fair, let's fair. But <laughs> let's have questions. Um, yeah. Um, Village on Main construction is um, sailing right along. We're about to bring back the fourth round of people, so two rounds left, but both third floor wings. Um, we're about to start exterior work soon, so you're going to really start seeing the changes on the outside. Um, the interior common areas are still under heavy construction, but they should be start releasing the, at least the first floor lobby, which is the most it is the most disruptive because it's just everybody has to go through there. Yeah. Um, that should be wrapping up here in a few weeks. Um, so we're just working on we're leasing up the units that we had held open for the transfers and that type of thing. So we're just trying to get everything ready for for the after period as well. So that construction will go through the end of September. Um, let's see. We have. I, I just yep. was going to say, uh, uh, I really did enjoy that time we went through that, and I would like to go through those. Uh, if I mean, look, the 
have our meetings at some of those other locations like we talked about. Mm -hmm. I thought we were kind of going to head down that path and then move it. As much as this room is great, <laughs> and and I really uh, appreciate the, the, the update. Uh, I think it's nice to get a right hands-on feel. Yeah, I think one of the things on that we it was the pre-session component of it in terms of how we do it, and so I think. I have spoken with um, Don in regards to the pre-session, so if mm -hmm. council would like to have um, LHA board meetings at properties, we could always move the LHA pre-set or I mean the pre-sessions to the properties as well, and Don would just accommodate and, and go okay. over there so that that way you guys are not traveling back and forth board. between locations. Um, mm -hmm. If that's something you would like to consider, we just need direction from you all on to move yeah. the pre-sessions to the LHA property. I would be in support of that, but that, do we need to do that at a, at a council meeting? That's correct. I, I, Probably. I, I, I think we better because, well, even though people can't attend, yeah. you would also have to let people who want to go to the LHA meetings where that's going to be. If they're going to be more like you might be heard. So. Do we just have to coordinate building access? But do we have, we have to make the motion then? The only other thing we could do is move the pre-sessions <laughs> off of the LHA meetings and move them to a regular council meeting, mm -hmm. and then it's just an LHA meeting. Or to the other study session. Yeah. The, right. Yeah. But we'll need to talk about that at yeah. the council meeting. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So. So for the remainder of the development updates. Yes. Um, it, if you want, I, we can put that on the agenda for the next pre-session <laughs> okay. with the council, and we can talk about that in the pre-session. In the pre-session. Pre pre okay, that's okay. good. That was good. Okay. So between Ascent and Village and um, our Chrisman and Zinnia, because even once construction is complete or being done by someone else, especially for Zinnia, we are, help, we are leasing up that building. It is an operational phase that you go into and it is a lot of work too. Um, so the development team is pretty loaded up and now the operations team too because it's limited to that phase. Um, so we've got things cooking for the next thing that we want to take on in terms of a larger project uh, but I think for, for now Village doing um, self-performing construction is really time consuming. Katie's been absolutely rocking it but it takes a lot of time, and then obviously we're prepping for a closing, so we haven't looked very far beyond the SAR. <laughs> but we do have a long-term projection and plan that we still are working on, on ideas that are forming and bubbling up, so. Yeah, so if you remember when we, and when we get into budget, we'll show you this when we're starting to forecast the fund balance and when the development fee revenue is starting to come into the system. Um, when we were, I think, starting to look at that next project, we're looking at potentially at a horizon late 25, but more than likely 26. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that allows us to manage our fund balances mm -hmm. as, we're, as we're moving forward, and then it's going to depend on, on how we approach it. One of the things, and I'm going to jump in part of my executive director report is, um, that we're really trying to be mindful of right now is staff workload and capacity. Yes. Um, you know, as we were working through some issues at Village on Main, um, we had to bring in different work groups to help with the files and, and what was really going on there. So, so in my mind right now, it's, it's, it's really have to and need to um, for the day in, in terms of managing that capacity and workload and not overwhelming folks. So that's conversations that I'm having with Lauren and, and Molly at different times. Just to, we need to be really mindful of that. I, I agree. I yeah. don't, um, you know, you were talking about the, the larger piece that you showed us. I would put that on the back burner if I were you until you get these others well underway. Because burnout, mm -hmm. Burnout is, is not fun. Yeah. And, and then you get nobody excited about doing anything. They're just overloaded. Mm -hmm. And they're all going to have to take a long vacation mm -hmm. to a real great country. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think so when you think about it, right? So the, on, on the Ascent project, 
Um, and you can probably talk about this. Like it's a, it's intense right now mm -hmm. as you're heading to closing. You'll get into closing and then you'll move into construction period, mm -hmm. which will the intensity mm -hmm. will subside a little bit. But you're still on their own pace to right. finish it. <laughs> <laughs> but then when they get toward completion, mm -hmm. the intensity operationally starts picking up because now you're getting into the tenant selection plans. And this one, you know, speaking of what we were looking at at the suites related to proximity to child care. Mm -hmm. This tenant selection plan is going to be a little bit different because you're going to have child care in the facility, which is going to bring up some of these registered sex offender mm -hmm. issues and they'll present themselves in a different way because you're inside of 200 feet. Mm -hmm. So you'll see that intensity operationally pick up and so what we try to look at then is, okay, is Katie's winding down and the development staff's winding down you know, that's when you start looking at the next development project and then you're, you're offsetting these peaks to where the operational peak isn't coinciding with the development peak, but they're working together so you're moving in and out of it. I think we're getting a better understanding of that and we just need to continue working it. So just to summarize, we closed Christmas in June 2022, Zinnia May 2023, Village December 2023, Ascent July 2024. For a small housing authority with one Ooh. development project manager, that is That's insane. Mm -hmm. um, we also were using <coughs> development partners for that purpose. But that's but why we partner. Yes, absolutely. Because we don't have, we can't self-perform. And so that's where the partner is important. Now as we start building capacity mm -hmm. and we look globally down the road, you know, what I would like to see as we build capacity is you have one partnership going where we're not doing as much work but maybe one self-performance and trying to mix and match but you know we're still building. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Some larger housing authorities don't have that type of closing schedule um, but that also but there's also other factors you know Longmont we have this we had all these projects in the mix and Chaffa pays attention to that too. And they might normalize out our schedule as well because they're trying to balance the regional needs. But, um, but we'll see. Okay. Although the Chief Operating Officer did manage do to like this, find me at the uh, grand opening of Christmas. Yeah, it was. And it was like, well, what else are you working on? So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm out. But, I mean, it's a good thing, right? Yeah, it's a good thing. Definitely good. Yep, you're rocking it. I think that's all for development for today. Uh, okay, you know, operations. Kind of like this report all is kind of merging into, <laughs> mm -hmm. you're hitting every aspect even though you have different categories here. So, so before Lauren's now going to give the operational report, that's why we brought her in as the assistant director. Um, I, I did want to let you all know, thank you, thank you for letting us hire this position. Um, because while she's drinking out of the uh, fire hose right now, I can say from my position in probably Molly's, our lives are dramatically different when we're in here. And, and so it's, it's really been a big help. And um, she's doing some really great things with residents and had a, a good day to day with yeah. one of our properties that we have struggled with over time. So mm -hmm. I don't know if you heard me come in and we, I went, that's why we hired you. Yes. She's doing that work. And so I just wanted to, to let you all know that we really appreciate you doing that mm -hmm. because I think I would have pulled out whatever hair I had left in my head. <laughs> Go for yes, it. So um, I won't get into the weeds on this on this report. I just want to hit on a couple things. We have about um, 35 to 40 vacant units across the portfolio. Only two are meth related. Oh yeah. Oh, wow. We are down. So um, unfortunately, we're also out of money <laughs> to fix them. So we're looking into how to fund that. We have one at the Swedes um, that is pending uh, contamination cleanup and then it needs to be remediated. Mm -hmm. And so we're working with the accounting team to figure out how we're going to pay for that with so many vacants at the suites. Mm -hmm. Most of them are MHP 
uh, vouchers. So we're working really closely with MHP to try and get those units filled because if we can get that that rental income, then we can sort of you know project uh, income to address this one unit. Mm -hmm. um, and then Aspen Meadows neighborhood, this is a unit that's been down for quite a bit and was where we didn't have insurance anymore. We partnered with Habitat for Humanity to do some of the work. So right now it's just to the drywall. Mm -hmm. Everything else needs to be added. Floors, uh, baseboards, doors, cabinets, and appliances. So we need to do some work to figure out how we're gonna cover that. Um, but we're making a lot of changes operationally, getting a little bit more streamlined on filling in the units, going through our wait list, um, working really closely with our property managers and our admin team. Um, to, to shore up that process and get it moving faster and also to make sure that unit turns are a priority. We don't want to we don't want to wait for a, a tenant to be ready versus the unit to be ready. We want the units to always be ready so that when a tenant comes up we can get them housed quickly because um, that process can take um, time as well and so I'd rather just have the units ready to go. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so we're doing pretty well on the occupancy there. We had um, four units at Briarwood, um, I think the majority of them were meth affected, mm -hmm. and those are all back up and running, and we're working um, hard to get those rented out as well. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, we've had a lot of change, mm -hmm. so I'll flip over to the property updates. Um, as you may know, Lisa Gallinar, our regional property manager, resigned. Um, she spent a lot of time working really hard with LAJ, and so we, we will miss her and appreciate her years of dedication. Um, so we're working on, anytime someone leaves is a great time to reevaluate a role, mm -hmm. what's needed, what, what worked, what didn't. And so um, I'm working on that with um, Harold and Molly, and I've discussed it with all of our teams across LHA on what they would like to see for that role, um, where, what were the strong needs versus, you know, the needs versus wants at this point, um, and what do we want to focus on, so we'll be getting that role filled. Um, we have two, um, assistant community manager roles. One, we've made two offers. One has accepted, one is pending. Mm -hmm. I'm working with that person on trying to get them uh, to come on board. And then um, we also have an opening for a community manager, an internal opportunity. So we hope to fill that one and then we'll need to backfill another assistant community manager for that. So working really hard to get um, everyone staffed up to Harold's point. Everyone is um, a little overwhelmed and we've been mm -hmm doing the best we can. Um, we did recently hire a maintenance technician named Zellmir, he goes by Z, and he's at Fall River Spring Creek. Um, and as you know, John was promoted to community manager at Fall River and Spring Creek, so that team is, is working closely together now to get everything um, up and running there, because we had some, some issues with not having a technician and then not having a mm -hmm. property manager when those two roles were gone. Um, and we've just been having our coffees and conversations, keeping in contact with residents, dealing with resident issues as they come up. Um, you may hear about our landscaping issues with dying grass. I don't know if you guys already heard about that. Yes. Um, we hired a new landscape company, and they have not lived up to the expectations, unfortunately, but it is late in the game to switch. And so mm -hmm. we're just working really hard, pushing them to fulfill their contractual obligations, and then we will evaluate um, after we get everything up and running and see. I don't know that we would, I uh, can't speak to that. Whether or not we will continue onward, but we'll see what we can do to work out that situation. Um, we're waiting on uh, repairs for irrigation at all the properties, pretty much. Mm -hmm. uh, they have, all the irrigation systems have something wrong with them, whether mm -hmm. it's uh, a mainline break or a computer issue. Mm -hmm. uh, we still have our security services at all the properties doing their nightly, um, property runs and everyone really still likes that. Um, at, at Aspen Meadows, we've had Summer, our assistant community manager, who's really stepped up and been taking care of that property in Lisa's absence, and so I'm really happy um, to have her on our team. Um, Molly is actively working with um, our uh, construction company, flooring uh, subcontractor, and um, the architect at Aspen Meadows Senior for the flooring issues that you're aware of. Um, seeing what we can do about that. Um, Briarwood, I have a picture on here of the new handled handrails that were installed at Briarwood, which is part of our voluntary compliance agreement with 
HUD, so those are brand new. That was funded by CDBG COVID money that City Council, you all and your role City Council approved. Yeah. So thank you for that. Uh, Village on Main, you know, we're almost to the finish line um, working on that property. Uh, Fall River and Spring Creek, I've already talked about getting those units up and running and that new team of John and Z. Um, no real updates at Hardstone and Lodge. It's a, a probably one of our easiest communities <laughs> to work with. Um, and then Zinnia, we're, you know, rocking on the tenant selection plan and getting ready for lease up. Um, construction is expected late September, early October. Mm -hmm. um, that will be uh, a lot of work for our team. Um, but I think we have a good, we have a really strong property manager at, at the suites and who will be taking over Zinnia. Mm -hmm. um, Christmas too, we have our grand opening. Thank you for attending, for those who were able to. Um, and then I think that's it, because I already made the decisions. Anyone have any questions? All right, uh, Hearthstone and the Lodge, the, they're the newest ones, aren't they? No, they are our 202 crack HUD communities. So they're built in about 2012. Yeah, they're older. Oh, okay. Yeah. They need some work. Hmm. But we're waiting to figure out what we do for the building on that one. Yeah, that's the one when we were coming out of the, uh, when we talked about coming, that was a timing issue. Um, so to pull it out of the 202 process, you actually have to start it where you time it on the budget year, and it essentially, essentially operates like a resyndication where they give you the money to make the capital improvements. Mm -hmm. But the timing's really specific, and so we had to think we're targeting it through. Uh, yes, we're going to actually be start doing the work in 25 and probably tri pulling the trigger 26. Yeah. Um, I think once we get through summer, get through village construction and ascent closing, Katie's, we're going to start looking at pulling in a consultant to help us that's specialized in doing two of the <coughs> um, So later this year we'll start timing it out more precisely. And that'll make it easier operationally because if, if you remember the, the, uh, the 202 budgets, we have to put them together, send them to HUD, and they have to approve them. Mm -hmm. And every year, you know, we're going, well, we need, this in we need these increases. And they're like, no, we're not going to give them to you. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, that's an actual cost. Mm -hmm. So the budgeting process for those properties actually really inhibits what you can do for the residents and others based on that HUD process you mm -hmm. have to go through. So long term, it makes sense for us. It, it's a fair amount of work that we need to go through. Um, before we, uh, Sarah, do you want to go over safety? Sure. Um, we finally, the city finally signed a contract for our cameras. I just met with him this afternoon and really getting um, things rolling. And we have some other things we're needing cameras for, like uh, Village on Main right now which, uh, Katie, I've got good news for you because I worked that out today. Um, so now we just need to purchase things and get, get the ball rolling on that. Um, we're also working with, with um, the, the uh, sorry, um, getting the cameras for the new build on Hover as well, so getting that all lined up. Um, we ordered the meth detectors for the city bathrooms and we had to pivot away from putting or ordering any meth detectors for Village on Main like we had talked about last month due to the fact that we did not clean, or I should say we did not demo all of the, the, um, the units as far as walls go. So essentially they're not technically clean, so we didn't want to put you know, the goal is to put these meth detectors in clean units that we know um, are brand new or have been tested and, you know, remediated appropriately. So, um, have, again, pivot away from that. I don't know if Harold and Molly want to say anything more about that, but, um, and then security, I, um, just to kind of emphasize what Warren said, I'm working with them pretty much daily um, with the manager of the suites and security regarding um, just ongoing issues that um, not really resident based either you know a few residents are inviting some guests in that are causing problems but really it's um, 
the unhoused issues around the suites that are causing us problems. So um, really working with patrol and security and Jana to ensure that our residents are continue to be safe. Mm -hmm. That's all I have. Success is the residents, well, maybe not success for Sarah, but <laughs> success is the residents are actually calling Sarah. Yeah. And so, I mean, that's actually a really big step, you know, mm -hmm. if you looked at where we were with the yeah. suites and how they really felt about police and now the fact that they're reaching out to Sarah directly, I mean, that's success mm -hmm. when we look really long term at that property. Um, so when you talk about um, the unhoused at the suites, uh, uh, homeless people, is that what you're talking about? They're hanging around with the suites. Yeah. Um, there's a there's a bridge that uh, you you cross over right right before you get into the the cul-de-sac there. Uh -huh. So they like to go underneath there, and then also you know what we were all talking about earlier that um, the open space to the north side um, of the suites. So there's open space there, and then there's a ditch, and then there's more open space on the north side. Um, there is going to be townhomes built north of the ditch, as you're sure you're all aware of. Um, so that will help, I guess, with that area. But for now, um, we're just, residents are continuing to let me know when they're seeing people back there. And the same with um, the staff. So I, I actually called in today. Patrol is out there earlier today and then went back out when I called in. So it's, it's slow but sure. I mean, most of the folks know that that's city property, so. Part of the challenge, I mean, this is a bigger issue that we're working on at the property. So when we look at this, uh, where the trail comes under over, you all, I know we've gotten a lot of emails about what's happening there. Mm -hmm. So when you take that here, you take this here and you take the bridge here, I mean, that's kind of where we're seeing the majority of our calls coming in. And, and so that, the neighborhood impact team met with us last week um, and we're looking at different options in terms of how we approach it. Um, to be frank, this, this area right here is getting so significant that we're thinking about potentially having to do some kind of temporary closure uh, just because of the challenges and the, and the feedback we're getting from the residents of our community. I do think that the camera project being the contract being signed, when we look at it from a global perspective, may actually help because there's some automation of cameras and AI that we can use that can facilitate. Carol? Sorry, could you repeat that? I couldn't I couldn't hear what you said and I got a lot of people who have called me about it. Oh, so when, when we talked about what, what Sarah was talking about, it's really this, Sarah, would you agree it's this stretch from this bridge through this area right here to sort of being yes. globally what we're, what we're dealing with? And and this is probably the biggest challenge here in terms of if you, uh, I'll see if I can show you. Uh, escape. You can see what we're talking about. You can see what. Sarah, where do I need to go up here? Right at the bridge. Yes, yeah. yes, so go, keep going. There you go, by the bank right there on yeah. this side. Yeah. There, yeah. there it is. There you go. So this is a um, dry creek. Mm -hmm. And so this little tunnel is completely enclosed. And that's the pedestrian access. Mm -hmm. And so what's happening is, is we have people just staying in that area at all times. Um, 
I guess harassing could be the word that we would use when we have cyclists and pedestrians in that area. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we get a lot of calls for service. And, and so we know we need to figure this space out. And so that's part of what we're potentially looking at with the camera system. Um, and again, it's timing. The camera system actually has some AI components built in that we can set timers to meet our ordinance requirements. Mm -hmm. They can figure out how long people have been there. So, you know, the point about it is, is these are broader community issues, but it's the same community issues that impact here. And, I, you know, Sarah and I, if I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, Sarah, we kind of talk about it in terms of Sometimes it's outside influences that are trying to engage with the people in the properties mm -hmm. that really is taking advantage of individuals. And so, um, mm -hmm. I mean, we, I personally have been there with Sarah when certain individuals are trying to get in and we knew that was when they were getting their checks. Oh, and man. so there's challenges that we're trying to, but that's again how we work collectively and utilize technology to deal with some of these issues. But um, I know you are getting complaints. We're still trying to figure out how to deal with this broader area. We don't have the answer yet, but we'll be bringing that to you in your role as council. Is that it, Sarah? Yes, that's it. Sorry, I didn't unmute myself. So. The last part of my report, so as we brought Lauren on um, and with the changes with Lisa in, in that position, Lauren is currently relooking at the job description so we can be a little bit more fine-tuned in terms of, of that position. Mm -hmm. Some of the immediate changes that we made operationally is uh, we weren't seeing uh, people at the appropriate level for decision making mm -hmm. and so we started pushing that down so we had emergency calls for service going to different folks, but the property managers weren't necessarily in that chain. And so we now have the property managers as a front end on terms of emergency calls and properties because they know that better. So Lauren's right in the middle of restructuring some of these, but really it's about placing decision making at the appropriate level. Mm -hmm. um, the, the other thing that we've been working on, Kendra's been working on, um, so we've been having challenges with our insurance carrier. I think we told you we lost our meth insurance and some other issues. Um, the customer service was not great. Uh, we actually began conversations with the insurance broker that um, is part of the IGA that the city has. So we began conversations with the city's insurance broker. Mm -hmm. um, and so to Kendra's point, as we were working through this, she's had more assistance in two weeks than we've had historically from this other company. So I have given her direction to move and change insurance companies um, in evaluating everything that we had that brought up some interesting points that we're going to look at from an insurance perspective. Uh, one is errors and emissions for property managers. That's not in place. Um, something that's becoming a thing, and I don't know if you all have heard about it at Penrose, but uh, tax credit uh, recapture from the investors is starting to be a thing that's occurring when units are vacant um, and they're not necessarily getting their tax credits and so there's some insurance policies out there to cover that. So they've made a series of recommendations for us in terms of the insurance that we need to have in place. The biggest news is, is they think there may be the potential for us to get pollution insurance again and pollution is bad. And so they're going to start evaluating that process for us. And this is obviously a really large company that has access. Um, we didn't want to do it on a commission basis. We wanted to do it on a broker fee. But they really feel like the best approach right now is to go in commission now as we currently approach insurance, but transition into a broker fee once we're in it a year. So they, so we will be changing our insurance policies and it'll be the same company that we're working with on the city side. So we have a long-standing relationship. Can you go back to investors uh, are getting insurance for vacancies? Uh, did I understand that correctly? No, it's when you have a vacant unit that impacts the revenue right. screen and they, they don't get the tax credit because of that. They're now suing 
owners and property managers for the not getting that tax credit, I think is the best way to use it. Yields are getting tighter for investors, so they're yeah. seeking every means they can to get their returns. Because yeah. if a unit is, is occupied all year, but it's vacant on December 31st, it's counted as vacant for the year and you don't get the tax credit. Well, that's not fair. So, it, and it's a concern with all yeah. of the yeah. vacant units due to the meth remediation. We can't, yeah. we can't um, fill those units until they're remediated legally. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the occupancy, the, the occupancy parties get cold. Mm -hmm. So, um, we're working closely with CHAPA mm -hmm. to, to monitor that, but that could be something that would be okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, is that it for your reports and updates? Do we have any commissioner comments? Questions? I have one. Yes. I don't know if any other commissioners got an email. I got an email today from a resident, but I'm pretty confident that Mountain View Plaza is not an OHA property. I was in touch with that resident as well. Today. About the VIA contract. Oh. So I don't know well, if, if you're in contact, you probably had a better answer for her. Than she was hoping that um, she knew about the via services for seniors of LHA properties. I was hoping that um, they could include Mountain View Plaza, which I am familiar with that property because that's the property that's got the um, award of pri private activity bonds just here a month ago to do a rehab and resyndication of tax credit. So um, it is not an LHA property. So we couldn't add it onto the LHA contract, but I told her that I would get in touch with um, senior services if there's any assistance Phil. available but Phil. Oh, for microtransit. Well no Phil for right now there's accessoride and then there's the um, flex. You know, the, the flex but accessoride and so if there's a if if there's a disability or something associated with it, that's free. Right. I think so, so far she was only referencing seniors at the okay. moment, but we can always yeah. we can hit all the boxes. Sarah, you, uh, you have your hand up. Yes, thank you. Um, that property is currently being sold along with two other multifamilies here in, in, in town. Um, Hudson Company is a current property manager of Mountain View, and um, I have a lot of history of not great things there, so um, if anyone wants more information, you can pick my brain. Okay. That is being sold to a low income, I should say, affordable housing developer sufficient in low income housing tax credits. They intend to do private activity bond financing and get a tax credit award to do a big re syndication or rehab. Um, it is, it is the entire AMC property is served Lincoln? by HCB vouchers. Hmm? AMC? Lincoln Communities? Okay, I think AMC Property Management is going to manage it. Okay. So, no other comments? Can I have a motion to adjourn? I move we adjourn. Second. We move by Commissioner McCoy. Second by Commissioner McCoy that we adjourn. All those in favor? Yeah. Okay. Aye. 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 Aye